Hey, what's going on? Give me a second. Yeah, that background glare was a little bit crazy. Yeah, man, but I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, been pretty busy, haven't been able to live stream as much, but uh, just wanted to check in because a lot of the topics I want to talk about were getting backlogged. I have uh, not been tweeting that much. I've been trying to only tweet to promote the show. So going forward, if you want to hear any of our thoughts, Subscribe to the show at patreon.com forward slash champagne sharks. Become a member. Also, you know, subscribe to the live streams over at youtube.com forward slash champagne sharks. Or you can go over to Twitch. I think it's twitch.tv forward slash champagne sharks too. But uh, real keep house clean, real quick house cleaning. Uh, hit the super chat if you're enjoying the stream. That's that daughter sign on the bottom of the screen if you want to give us a tip support the show yeah if anything that we say to you you find is useful enriches your life helps you see the world in a different way gives you tools to help you understand yourself your world and the world of others better then by all means uh feel free to support us financially you can hit us at paypal at champagne sharks at gmail.com venmo or cash app at Champagne Sharks. Go to patreon.com forward slash Champagne Sharks to support us in that way. And the other option you can also do is if you can't financially support the show, then just like, comment, share, subscribe. That is free and it is very helpful, especially the sharing part. Don't keep all this goodness to yourself. And all that stuff's going to be scrolling at the bottom throughout this show so you can definitely keep up with it but i hope everybody's doing well yeah i mean i think so i don't know if i'm changing and maybe i'm becoming sane or if twitter is actually getting worse but i just feel like it's just more toxic than ever like maybe it's the same toxicity it always was and maybe i'm getting healthier you know, that's a pleasant thought. I don't know. But I mean, like, there's so many times I was about to jump into, like, a conversation with someone saying something clearly stupid and out of pocket. And I'm like, you know, why? None of this is going to matter tomorrow. This person's not going to get any smarter. You know, it, I'm not going to change anything with this person. I'm just going to work myself up. You know what I mean? So, Yeah. I am only really going on there going forward to either one, ask questions. Like if I have a question, like I want someone to give me a tip on something like, hey, does anyone know a good uh, brand of this? You know, I have a lot of followers, so it's great for crowdsourcing tips on stuff. And the other thing is to advertise that we have new posts, new streams and things like that. So, yeah, if you want to hear our thoughts, there's not going to be any more long threads where we're just giving away uh, interesting insights on Twitter. I think Twitter's kind of diminishing returns anyway because my father account's been stuck at the same thing like forever. Yeah, yeah. No, our last couple of live streams, I think, have been in the afternoon, actually, before I uh, took a break from doing them. Yeah, but I find like uh, in the afternoon is kind of good, keeps you reach a different um, type of person, you know, person bored at work. And also uh, it's harder to go on as long in the daytime because I have things to do. You know what I'm saying? So it forces me to keep it short. So anyway, four minutes, 30 se 36 seconds, and I have not gotten to the topic yet. So I know the people who are super impatient, attention span destroyed, they're going to be leaving comments. It's four minutes, man. You're wasting people's time. Get to the fucking point, you know? So um, to attention span people, uh, no need to comment. We're getting to the point now. Or better yet, just unfollow us because 
I really can't stand people who need you to cater to like their totally shot attention span, especially when there's a progress bar you can move and you can actually do double speed and triple speed or whatever speed you need to make it go faster. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, one thing I've been finding interesting is I think a lot of stuff is drying up. Like I've been talking about for a while. We had uh, Jason England on, and he was talking with us about it too. But also Yasmin ne- Nair and other people. I was on Jessica Crispin's podcast talking about it, but how there's kind of this uh, bubble going on where people are just throwing good money after bad to like support a lot of these kind of woke uh, creatives, you know, who just don't make any money. They don't bring any eyeballs. They're only really good at tweeting and being followed on Twitter, but they're not really good at actually, you know, getting a real populist grassroots movement, but they just keep these people around and keep letting them fail upward. And I just feel like a lot of it has to do with uh, the prestige of the whole thing. Like, Like, for example, I think HBO Max, is kind of really trying to lean into the we are the woke streaming network like they are somehow buying or bidding on every cliche black blue check uh novel or children's book or whatever and just adapting it and they're just adapting all types of stuff that i can tell right away like this thing is not going to sell it's just going to get you a lot of tweets they had a they inked a deal with um jeremy or harris who is who we're going to be talking about today mostly and yeah i mean i just tend to notice that it seems to me they are really trying to position themselves as the uh hip woke inclusive uh streamer but i think money's drying up i think eyeballs are drying up i also think you know especially with the exception of like disney because disney had disney plus and they've been doing Marvel shows. And I think people have been watching those Marvel shows, subscribing to those Marvel shows, but Warner brothers, like, you know, the DC movies have been pretty much a flop. The only thing that I can think of notably that came out was uh wonder woman. And that was, that was a flop. I think, I think Warner is in a harder place. They've had like more flops and you can see it in things that they're starting to cancel. Like they canceled Lovecraft country, which really surprised me. I knew it wasn't getting ratings. I know it wasn't doing that well, but they have a tendency to just um, give these things like prestige renewals, you know, uh, because they like how it makes a channel look or they don't want to look racist or, you know, they just figure the um, critical buzz that they get, you know, will be made up with money they make somewhere else. So it's almost like a lost leader. But I think right now nothing is really making money like that. So the era of being tolerant of non-make non-money-making things that give you prestige i think that's fading away and you're seeing it like it was not the cheapest show to produce from what i read but i looked at the ratings and it wasn't doing great i mean i think it was getting hundreds of thousands of viewers i think like certain episodes like the premiere and the end i think got like a million or so i forget exactly it's on the wikipedia but i didn't pull it up but given what the show looked like it cost to produce you know that wasn't uh, enough but i think even with those numbers they would have at least given it like a pity renewal and then announced next season's the last season but they didn't even do that like they gave black lady sketch show which has far less uh, ratings, like way, way, way less um, a renewal for a third season. And I know nobody watches that either. Like like I said, I looked at the ratings, but I think it got renewed before things started getting tight at, you know, Warner and a lot of these places. And I also think too uh, that, because it costs so much less like like that thing just looks like it's really really cheap to make so even with the less ratings it's probably not hurting them that much but the days of things 
spending a lot of money on things seems to be drying up. Like you still see some bidding war announcements over some new book by an aspiring black blue check. And it's, you know, it's about hair and microaggressions and whatever. And you'll find out still sometimes 15 place bidding war, you know, but for the most part, I think that's drying up. And then when the real economy crashes, which I think is going to happen at some point, I think it's going to really hurt their ability to just uh, throw money at stupid things. That's my take on it. Uh, oh, my God. It was so bad. It was so bad. Uh, we're going to talk about that, too. He appeared on Gossip Girl. And he's kind of like the patron saint of Gossip Girl. He has some kind of weird involvement in it. And he's kind of like a mascot and everything. Yeah, this was like most of them are. They're like a combination of coming of age story about hair and microaggressions and a white woke bay with a beard who is white, but he's woke. And, you know, he understands not to say the N-word when he recites rap songs. That was actually a line in the uh, the Hate You Give novel. <laughs> <laughs> that what made the white uh, woke base so great was that uh, he remembered not to uh, say the n-word parts of a rap song. <laughs> that was the the yeah those those things are are all awful. They're they're freaking awful. Yeah yeah. Black Lady Sketch Show, man. I think they almost pay HBO for that show. Like like that show looks so cheap, man. That show there's like web series that look better than that thing. Yeah, so yeah, I think COVID is going to speed up a lot of this stuff, but check it out. Uh, after it got announced that it was canceled, they were saying uh, the Emmys came out and it got like 18 nominations, uh, Lovecraft Country. So it's like the critics were eating it up. The people weren't. And, bef and usually critical praise like that would uh, have bought you, you know, another season because of how much... Uh, critical praise was getting and the fact that you know that still didn't save the show i think it says i think it says a lot oh yeah somebody told me this that the guy who plays the white guy in um in the hate you give yeah he's on riverdale and he cleans up with all the uh, women of color in that show too that's uh pretty funny yeah you know black lee sketch show is painfully unfunny, but that's usually not a reason for something not to be successful these days. I mean, not successful in ratings, because none of these things are successful in ratings, but successful in, you know, critical acclaim and renewals. Like, if not being funny was a metric for these things getting approved or renewed, they're pretty much, they, 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 these people have no shows, because these people aren't funny. Like I said before, I think these people, humor to them is like emotions to Dexter on the show Dexter. Like, they kind of study it like a script, and and try to ape it, you know, like, but I don't think they actually know or have a sense of humor to laugh at something funny or know how to make something funny or whatever. It's just like, you know, a robotic algorithm in their head, you know, they're like human bots. It's like, uh, there's a cadence, there's an order that you make a face, you know, they look at humor and they just try to break it down to its like ingredients, but there's like no soul in it. So it's like, Okay, I took Chicago improv. I took a stand up workshop, you know, after college. You know, I heard it's a great way to break into entertainment. I want to be the next Hassan Minaj. And, uh, you know, I've never been funny my whole life. I've never been a class clown. I've never made my own family laugh, you know. But being funny is uh, the way to be a public intellectual now. It's the way to break into everything. You know, I want to be a woke stand up. There's an alt comedy scene now, and I want to be part of that. But, I just don't understand humor, you know, in school when the class clown made everyone else laugh. I was always curious and I just wanted to report them to the teacher. I was a hall monitor. But anyway, I'm smart. I went to the Ivy League. So I'm just going to how hard can it be? And they take these classes. It's like the person uh, I played the clip of uh, the King of the Hill where uh, Bobby Hill uh, finds an intellectual to teach him how to be funny. And uh, the intellectual is like you know, making him super unfunny. And he ends up pulling out a whoopee cushion and killing the audience with a whoopee cushion. He ends up throwing away all the highbrow advice of of the of the um, highbrow comedy coach, you know? 
Yo, are these like white people that tell you this? Like, I always wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Award shows now are wholly for virtue signaling. Yeah, they're reflecting funny. They save the cat comedy. Yeah. For people know what save the cat is exactly what it is. Like screenwriting gurus and stuff. They take improv classes. And you know, and improv is something in general. I no offense to people who do improv. 90% of the time, improv is not funny. Improv is should be called it's funny because it's fast. That's 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 the conceit of improv. Like, yeah, it's hard to do, it's fast, it's quick on his feet, it's clever. 90% of the time, it's not funny. It's just funny because it's fast. Nothing that people like in improv, or at least most of what people like in improv, if it was a regular sketch show and you told someone that you prepared a week to make it, people would hate most improv skits. It's just, uh, it feels funny because it's fast, you know? So I don't think it helps these people to become improv people. Um, the standup is pretty terrible, but they, they memorize it like, okay, setup, punchline, joke, timing, Make a face, make your voice go up at the end of the sentence. Like, no, 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 you know, laughter. Okay, I got it. You know, and then they go out there and they, and they do the cadence and they go, doo, 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 you know, make the face, like, you know, and then it's just crickets, you know, and then they decide everybody is um, misogynist or racist or homophobic in the audience. That's pretty much. Um, and like, don't get me wrong, a lot of these reactionary types who do comedy are pretty unfunny too, but, and, and their own audience is like just a bunch of, um, sycophants, like doing boosterism. Like, I don't want to just pick on like, you know, the woke crowd, but you know, the, the black community is not in that real reactionary crowd really, you know? So, and I tend to mostly talk about the, um, what's happening in, in black arts and everything. <laughs> my childhood friend took an improv class and wouldn't invite her friend to the performance because she knew they were clown her. Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I think that's what I think, uh, humor is. And, and lecturing. You know, they, they do all the... They're like, okay, so I do all the uh, ticks and, and cadences and everything of what a joke is because, you know, I've been watching these comedians and you know, I don't understand why everybody's laughing, but I understand that the guy spoke at this speed with this cadence, brought up like something observational, and then uh, you know, raised his voice at the end with you know, made a face. So yeah, I think that'll work. And then so what can I observe? Okay, I don't really have any life. Uh, I don't really have any self-awareness or insight. Uh okay, I know what I'll just lecture from my um college classes. So it's like Hey, you know, isn't it funny how everybody's racist and misogynistic? You know, and then the audience is like, Yo, that's not even a fucking joke. Like, what is that? That's like nothing, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, comedy as an expert in, as an exercise in pattern recognition. That's exactly. Oh, yeah. You know, you know what's especially bad about uh, Saturday Night Live? Saturday Night Live, for all its faults, someone could argue whether it was ever funny. I think it was actually funny at some times in his past. You know, the 80s, Eddie Murphy years were great. The early, like, John Lovitz, Adam Sandler, Chris Farley years, those were great. They age well. I've seen those again. Even Dennis Miller's largely unfunny now. I look at those old clips, and, you know, he was hitting on all cylinders. You know, but the thing with... The thing with old Saturday Night Live, there was no social media yet. So old Saturday Night Live wasn't just for like people who read the New Yorker or the Atlantic or the Sunday times. It had a very populous, like flyover country type of appeal. Everything could easily be understood. It was very lowest common denominator for better or worse, you know, but, um, yeah, the, am I right era of comedy coach Neil, you, you named it. That's exactly uh, what it is. Whenever I try to watch Saturday Night Live now, it's not accessible like that. It's Twitter, blue check, think piece, conversation. Like, it's very, very much like the people who were writing for these shows, you know, I think always were pedigree. They always went to places like Harvard or, 
you know, Yale or schools like that. Like, I don't think that's new, but there used to be a mix of like blue collar uh, and stand up comedians and stuff. When you read stories about how people became writers on Saturday Night Live and stuff like that. And the subject matter was really broad, but yeah, now it's really think piecey. It's like stuff that they're talking about on Twitter and talking points that are like on Twitter and social media and in BuzzFeed think pieces. It's very BuzzFeed now. It's, um, I think it's part of what makes it uncomfortable because it's like that same, am I right, humor, but only for a really um, small amount. So it's like, I think these kind of people, like these cultural elites were always had a hand in making Saturday Night Live, but the difference is back then they knew that to make it for everybody, whereas now these kind of cultural elite types only make it for themselves. Yeah. It's true. Like it needs a context of social media in order to make any sense now. Yeah. Whew. Anyway, I didn't get to Jeremy or Harris yet, but the title says and more. So this has been the and more part. So um what we were what we were um getting at, right? The Zola movie came out, and that movie was co-written by Jeremy O'Harris and Janisco Bravo. And directed by Janisco Bravo. Janisco Bravo directed the horrible, horrible episode of um, Them with the full-on gang rape of a black woman in the Jim Crow South in the most exploitative way. And a way that, to me, clearly evidence didn't really care about the topic. It was very, very tacky. But um, that was pretty... What's well, pretty um, interesting about it, right? He was pulling all these strange gimmicks, and the gimmicks involved like telling people, "Hey guys, I'm gonna be at this theater uh, watching Zola. Everybody come, you know." And he was basically constantly inviting people and making like a stunt out of it, you know, like because everything is about basically his own self-aggrandizement and his own celebrity and stuff. But to me, it kind of evidenced that he was very worried about the actual performance of, of this, you know, like, because, um, it needed, it needed to be, it needed to be, um, make a certain amount of money. Like they put it only in theaters at first and not, pay-per-view for like a couple of weeks and i think they really want to get people to um see it anyway all the stuff he was doing was making me think okay this thing is not doing that good and you know i was one of the people that uh pointed out and and revealed because the media was not covering it that it turns out slave play was a flop it made no money it was a uh, and then he found my thread on it and then he said oh it was never intended to make money. It was meant to uh, bring theater to undeserved to underserved communities and stuff. And it's like, come on, nobody's making Broadway theater for charity, you know. Like, like, give me, give me a break, you know. Like, uh, but I think that what kind of happens is I think a lot of these people know that yeah, I'm being kept around because I'm good at social media. I'm a personality. I'm good at creating buzz. But these people are eventually hoping that the buzz and the promise of me doing my own marketing and the promise of me um, doing a lot of the heavy lifting and like, you know, the promotion stuff is eventually going to pay off in something. So I, I think they know that um, buzz is when you only get so far. If you do two or three or four things that do nothing but get buzz and whatever, they'll just find another Negro who's good at tweeting because there's a lot of black people who are good at social media and, and getting attention and just hope that, you know, one of them is going to be the one to to uh, take it. You know, yeah, yeah. Like, same, same with Lil Nas X. Lil Nas X has one song. He's a one-hit wonder. He can't rap. He can't sing. He's not really even into rapping. He was a tweet decker um, barb. He was a Nicki Minaj stan. And then he just did this kind of like as a lark, and he's barely produced any songs. Nobody remembers his songs, except for old 
Old Town Road. That's the only one people remember. Nobody's humming that Call Me By Your Name song. No one sings it. No one bumps it in their earphones or their cars. If someone is doing that, they're if someone says they are doing that, they're either lying or they're just doing it to prove a point because somebody pointed out to them that they don't do that. And they're just trying to do it just to say that they do. But I don't think anybody does. People just like the controversy and, you know, to go on Twitter and, and laugh at the so-called man babies and the white tears and the male tears over his gayness. You know, like they look at it as like another lob in the culture war that they celebrate, but no one actually really likes it as a musical product. No one's going to be playing it in 10 years, much more than um, 10 minutes. Yeah, and yeah, he's pretty much like the same version of of that. Like The last thing Lil Nas X did I saw was a jail video where he and a bunch of people are dancing naked in jail and prison. And I'm like, all you have is sex, you know? All that you really have. And first off, I think it's kind of insulting to gay people that you're just reducing gayness to just sex and nudity and displays of uh, sex. But second, even that has diminishing returns. Like, you're really getting desperate. Like, you're dancing naked with five guys in jail. What else can you do? Like, what else do you have? How much more um, sexual titillation and whatever can you keep drawing on? Like, that last prison one, got so little buzz like he did the uh lap dance with the devil thing then he did the um um the kissing the guy at bet now he's doing this naked thing and it's diminishing returns each time you know um and none of it is like new it's like 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 uh he's saying right here little nas x is like a super big version of Madonna, who is mad corny, but at least did it uh, decades ago. People praising this video. See, what people praise the video, people praise the idea of these people and what they stand for. And what I mean by that is getting platforms. Like, what these people like is these people have a parasocial and narcissistic relationship to all these blue checks. Like, this, what I call blue checks and what I call wanna checks. Wanna checks are people who, when they dream of being a blue check, so they tweet like blue checks. They act sassy like blue checks. They do the same Twitterisms like not blah, 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 you know, or uh, Christopher Jamal Williams, the Christopher, and it's spelled D-T-H-E-E -E, and all the same stupid uh, Twitterisms. They all kind of try to, um, whether they're straight or gay, male or female, they all kind of try to tweet like... Um, black queer people like guess cosplay and they um do a lot of antics and they always like boost each other but what they really want they don't root for these people because of their art being any good they root for these people because they like the idea of blue checks and like them getting on big platforms like so when they cheer um jeremy harris's movie they don't really care about the plot mechanics, the themes, the messaging or anything about the movie. They just like, hey, a black queer person who uses Twitter all the time is made a big movie. So I identify with him. I'm one of these Twitter loudmouths, uh, blue checks or wannabe blue checks, or I'm one of the white people that likes to have these type of black people as mascots or, you know, um, whatever. I'm supporting the idea, like the notion of this happening. And like one example is like uh, on this channel, I've shown clips from Jamel Hill's um, YouTube page or things from like Alicia Garza's um, YouTube. And like one of the things that's interesting in the Alicia Garza uh, YouTube was that it had like double digit likes and 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 stuff like these videos and even on Issa Rae's page like she has one video that's announcing how big her empire is blowing up and it has like six figure view count but everything else by her thoughts and everything is like 
three figure two so sometimes as low as two figure view counts so like people like when she announces her empire and these big movie studio partnerships and record labels she has people like her on hbo and they tweet about that but when it's time to actually just support something grassroots that she did which is her youtube sharing her thoughts they don't really care they don't really actually i think like these people but anyway um i think jeremy harris is realizing okay like um i can't you know I've got I've got to deliver. So he was doing all these gimmicks saying, hey, you know, make sure to see Zola in the theater. It's important to see it in the theater. It's uh, the most important thing you can do. And, you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, OK, so he's probably pretty, pretty desperate, you know. And then um, he would announce which theater he was going to see it at and invite people to come so they could see him. And then. That to me is, you know, part of the problem is that uh, you're trying to sell everything on personality, persona, celebrity. Like, so it's like, you know, oh, come out and see, come out and see me. You know, so it's not even about you going to see the movie. You're going somehow to see um, him. You know, um, and anyway. What happened? What happened? That was interesting. Was was this? Um, so he was doing he was doing all this stuff, uh, promoting, trying to get everybody to see, trying to uh, talk it up, name drop stuff, all these different things, and then um, the stories started coming out, and the stories were pretty interesting, right? Because if you look at the stories, and I'm going to show you one. I'm going to show you one now. I'm a little bit out of practice, so um, bear with me. But there was this story that came out. Yeah, this is exactly true. Like um, Fans in that scene don't really know how to like something, but rather how to stand, not even what's hot, uh, who's hot, really, you know? And what it represents, like in oh, this is represents this is this show is on HBO, like you know, a Lovecraft Crunchy is on HBO. Our tribe made it, and as long as these people make it to HBO, that means that when it's my turn, I'm gonna get to HBO too. You know, they they root for it mainly because of what it says about their chances to do the same thing. You know, I'm gonna tweet and spectacle myself into a HBO or Hulu show as as well. You know, so. Anyway, this is um, what it said. And if anybody has been donating, um, my apologies. I have not been looking at the chat because I've been pulling up other things. So I usually thank people who donate. But if I haven't thanked you, it's because I just haven't had a chance to look at the chat yet. So this story came out by Forbes. And it says, how A24 Zola proved the power and virality of black Twitter. And these people always do articles like this. Like, this is not a real article. Like, what is the story? Like, how does A24 Zola prove the virality and power of black Twitter? So the years old thread. Arguably, the thread shows the virality and power of black Twitter, but you know, this movie just shows the kind of the bankruptcy of of movies right now, and the and the creative bankruptcy of uh, black so called creatives. You know, like the people involved in this movie were not involved in making it viral. They were not uh, making this crazy thread. They're just uh, people who who use the internet a lot, use social media, and saw the same thread everyone else saw. But okay, what is this about, right? So so you look. There's a contributor group here. The author's name is Deshonda Brown, right? The group is called, and it says contributor group. So this is basically a circle of writers that they seem to have at Forbes. Now, Forbes is supposed to be a business magazine. Um, I believe it was founded by 
Malcolm Forbes and owned by the son Steve Forbes. But it's like a stuffed shirt business magazine. But, you know, they're getting into this culture writing thing, thing too. They're getting into this uh, culture war stuff. So this group is called Forbes the Culture with B-E-S in parentheses. So for the culture slash Forbes the Culture. And what it is, is, and this is why I think is really insidious. I feel like a lot of these um, white people are just kind of using these black creatives on their staffs in a place like the New York Times, they, they get this good opportunity to be on this big platform magazine or publication. And then what they basically do is when they get them in there, they treat them like kids at Thanksgiving. Like you can say at the kids table, you know, the adults are going to be here. And then, you know, we're going to throw you five pieces of construction paper and a box of crayons and just knock yourselves out while the adults do adult stuff. And I feel like that's the kind of thing they give a lot of these black writers to do. They give them like um, culture beats and, you know, the blackity black beat, which on its own doesn't have to be a bad thing. There's a lot of great culture writing. There's a lot of race writing, but they give them like this kind of superficial race or culture beat and then let them just use it to promote themselves and their friends and their own scenes. So this thing for this Forbes the culture, you know, which again I think is kind of uh silly. Right? Oh wait, Nina's arguing with uh we say Zola, I guess you mean Jeremy or Harris. That's that's interesting. Um I have to look at that later. And uh, oh my god, this is ridiculous. They said this. The Greer and the Root articles about Harris defending Dunham. They said the argument, yes, yeah, she's horrible, but Harris French proves she's using her white privilege for good. How is he even using his blackness for good? You know, like, like, give me, give me, give me a break, right? But anyway, look at this thing. Forbes, Forbes, a culture. I'm gonna put it in full screen so you can see it. I'm gonna take off this thing that's on the screen that's uh, blocking it. And um, so this article is about how it's about black Twitter. But what, what to me, black Twitter is like, this is showing that um, Jeremy O'Harris and Janika Bravo are are harnessing black Twitter. Like, they are the spokespeople of black Twitter. Like, but, you know, they're not. They're not the, the leaders of anything. Like, they're not part of, like, the original core, like, black Twitter that made black Twitter famous. They're just fans like, like everyone else. They're as much a part of like classic original black Twitter as like white liberals are. Like they're they're tourists in it. I don't consider myself part of even uh no the real black Twitter, the one that really made black Twitter blow up. But I think the original Zola thread was I think that was uh was part of black Twitter. But what this article is really about is um hey Black Twitter is a creative force. It's powerful. Black blue checks and black wanna checks are the representatives of black Twitter. And you need to give them jobs and whatever if you want to harness the power of black Twitter. So this is like telling white people that this is not really a story about anything. This is not a story that's like, hey, here's some information that will enlighten you. What this is is, Here's uh, our pitch for ourselves and our scene. You know, it would be like if uh, the music writers in the punk era, like Lester Bangs, just kept writing articles like, uh, here's how the punks are really killing it, you know? Um, hire us, pay us, you know? Like, and j But the punks aren't really doing anything, you know? Yeah, they really call themselves Forbes the culture, you know? But that's what they were, like, giving these... Uh, my, these uh, minority and women writers to do like just identity work that's like for the women is just pulling their guts about trauma all day long for the black people it's about white people why don't you love us or if it's a black woman it's both you know and yeah it's it's not these people have no direct uh, lifeline or thumb in the pulse of you know black twitter really anymore than anybody else so not really a part of it but they want to get they want to get that um 
they want to get that they want to get that clout at the end of the day so this thing goes on and on and it's not really breaking down the movie or whatever it's not talking about the box office of the movie you know it talks about the history of the thread which if anybody wants to know about the thread they can just google this it's it's such old news about the thread and it just talks about how great um you know Jeremy O'Hamish and Janice Bravo are for uh, bringing it. And they refer to themselves as Forbes the Culture. When Forbes the Culture asked King herself about what prompted her to tell her story on the social media platform, she simply responded, nothing. King had just been using Twitter the same way other users do. Um, this was a typical day in the Twitterverse. And it's okay, this is, no, this is not any information. You're not sharing anything. You know, it was just a bunch of um nonsense about what it was like to go viral what was behind the thread i mean there's been so many stories about this thread the thread doesn't have that much meat to it to um you know but um then there's the usual part that these stories have where people who are clearly their friends or people that they want to know they incorporate their views into the article but it's just really plugging their friends so from the internal perspective, R29 Unbothered's social media manager, Vanessa Koger, believes the power of Black Twitter increased the virality of Zola's original Twitter thread and ultimately transformed it into the feature film in theaters today. Who is this person? Why is she an expert on this? Who is she? She's clearly just someone that this person knows and was like, hey, I'm going to name drop you in my story. It'll help you know, you get some exposure, you know, and as somebody important to talk to. And when you write something, you know, make sure to name drop me. It's just, uh, so the whole thing is just about how great, you know, black Twitter is and how great uh, black blue checks are for bringing it, you know, to the to the screen. And it's a giant circle jerk. It's a giant reach around, patting themselves on the back, uh, talking about their own power. Cultural writer Naima Cochran noted how the power of Twitter has become evident from jobs and book deals to podcasts and television shows. However, Cochran pays homage to Zola for being the first of its kind. Now, Na Naima Cochran is another one of these people who's in these circles, you know. Then she ends with, follow me on Twitter, check out my website. And it's, um, I think the problem is when this bubble burst. These people, are, I think, are being in trouble, and I feel kind of bad for them because I feel like these white people are giving them just kind of junk work. They don't really double check it. They just let them use it as their private blogs and uh, personal flyers and personal booster things and whatever to talk about. Use it as their personal diaries and they're um, bigging up their friends, but they're not really building any real skills doing any hard reporting doing any hard criticism or analysis and, and i think they're gonna end up with a couple of years in this business and not really have anything of substance or value to show for it in terms of the body of work and then they're gonna be asked out and the white people are doing this kind of crappy superficial writing too but they're white and we're in a world where white supremacy and white privilege are a thing and i think at the end of the day those people are going to be okay yeah, it's it's um, a black influencer uh, pyramid scheme. Yeah, to totally. It's it's a total it's a total. Um... And something else that was funny too was, and this is true. In the year after uh, the Zola thing happened, there were so many black uh, influencers trying to make fake. Uh, Zola threads, <laughs> like you know, their own fake. Their own fake stories about uh, stuff that happened to them. It was really annoying. These people just don't have any single original idea in their life. Even when they see original idea, instead of seeing the original idea and using it as inspiration to do their own original idea, they all just rush to that new thing. Like, for example, when uh, Jordan Peele did uh, Get Out, that was basically an original idea in that it had black horror had not been done for a while but it was it's been a while and it was a black horror specifically tied into like the, you know the modern internet and think piece era and instead of like those people seeing it and being like 
wow, it's time for me to dust off whatever original idea I've had in my drawer. Because people don't have any original ideas in the drawer. And thinking, man, I could really... This shows that you don't have to be a clone all the time. You can actually be original and be successful and make money. Instead of taking that lesson from it, they all said, okay, the lesson to take from this is we have to do movies like this now. And then like 20 of them did these type of movies. And they're going to ruin the bag, not even just for themselves, but even for Jordan Peele. By the time Jordan Peele does his third horror movie, people are going to be sick of the whole thing, even the good ones, because of all these ripoffs, you know? Um. Yeah. So, what I thought was funny about um all this is after you know that thread came out and that thread talks nothing about the quality of the movie. That thread talks about nothing but the box office. You would think for talking so much about the power of Black Twitter, you would talk about the box office of the movie. So somebody looked it up and shared it, you know, and I tweeted this as you predicted, the black Twitter audio of blue checks and water checks have begun their narrative of trying to pretend this movie is some smash hit and cultural tour de force. Although looking at the budget and box office, I don't get how they can pretend that. And this is what um, I found. And you don't see this written up really anywhere. If anything, they're all doing victory laps in the press. But if you look in the particular week, this uh, came out, it was uh, Zola was only in week two, and it was at number 10. The week before, number nine. So it was number nine the first week. Okay, but it's an A24 movie, smaller budget. So you got to take into account, is it profitable within its budget? Because some mov movies make less money, but are actually more profitable because the budget is so low. Like, for example, My Big Fat Greek Wedding is about like, people know it is about five times more profitable than avatar even though avatar made a ton more money because avatar costs like hundreds of millions to make and my big fat greek wedding um cost like almost nothing uh so you know maybe because it's small in the budget so let's see in the budget says um actually the budget is not here the budget is somewhere else but the gross was 620,000. The total gross was uh, three, three million. And um, I'll, find, I'll find the budget. I thought it was in, that, in the screen, but it is it is not. I'm going to find I'm going to find the budget now. Zola budget. So um, the budget is says here five million. So yeah, I made three hundred and fifty thousand in that. Uh, now when you throw in all like the marketing and and everything else, it's going to be uh, yeah. So the opening weekend was um, one million. Um, yeah, so it's. I think it topped out at four point five, four point five million. I think four point five million is, and now it dropped out of the top, top ten altogether. And I think uh, going forward, it's going to be. I think going forward, it's going to be streaming mostly. They released it on the streaming network, so now people really aren't going to see it in the theater. But they're pretending. They're pretending, of course, that it had um, killed killed the game. You know. So, okay. So this is it. This is it. I found it. The budget is five million, but it made um, four point five million uh, total. So. It's um it made less than what it costs, and that's not even adding the marketing and all the other stuff. So what does this big prove the power of Black Twitter? You know, yeah. So yeah, the budget says five million, and then the box office, the final box office says about four point five million after all the weeks in in yeah. So 
it was un it was unprofitable at the end of the day and it also explains why he was doing all those antics of you know trying to get people to join him in the theater he was trying to use himself as a pied piper because that's all that he's really done he's not really built a reputation for his work he's built a reputation for himself as a enfant terrible you know as a which is the same thing that Lil Nas X is doing, you know? And the problem with basing things on your celebrity and your persona, it's almost like basing a movement on a leader. You know, um, if the leader's not there, people don't care. If the leader dies, the move, the everything dissipates, you know? Um, you're supposed to make it about the work, not about the personality. So he has to, like, show up places, do antics, do um, stunts. But if you look at something like Get Out, um, Jordan Peele didn't have to do that because people just really liked the movie, you know. Uh, people just really, people just really enjoyed it. Um, so anyway, uh, the next thing I saw that came out, uh, which was crazy, was this. Also, you have to make at least double the budget usually to break even. Because marketing costs usually cost the same as the budget. Yeah, so it didn't even make just a, the, the regular budget back, but it also didn't make... Yeah, so it's definitely not profitable, but you will never... Uh, let's see. So there was this thing, and I had tweeted, this is, based, this is just a puff piece with a lot of product placement. He's trying to coax strangers to boost his box office numbers to his movie, not visiting kids with cancer and taking them out. They make it sound so humanitarian. And this is what um, I'm talking about. And, and you will see. This is the article I'm linking to. But they had this article that was made to make him seem like he was doing something really humanitarian by bringing, by badgering strangers to come see the movie. And... This was in the New York Times. And this New York Times article says, Jeremy O'Harris takes his Twitter friends to the movies. Almost everyone I've met tells me it is their first time in the theater post pandemic. I want to do it in community. Like, this is not fucking, this is not, uh, feeding starving kids, you know, this is not missionary work. You're just standing outside a theater and tweeting desperately to get people to see your movie. Like, and the first thing I'm thinking is why is the writer writing this story? Uh, and why is the, um, why is the editor letting this be, be written? Like, you know, this is just another puff piece. So it says, on a recently overcast Tuesday afternoon, a small crowd formed outside the Village East by Angelica on 12th Street and 2nd Avenue. The gaggle of strangers had been invited on Twitter by Jeremy O'Harris, the slave play play playwright in Man About Town, to watch the film Zola. You know, The day before, Mr. Harris, who wrote the screenplay with Janiska Bravo, the film's director, posted a tweet that he would be attending the 310 show, beckoning his followers to join him at the theater. You know, and he's like, I have 45 tickets for people who can't afford it. Because, you know, he's just making it seem like he's doing some kind of charity, you know. But this isn't helping people eat. This is just comp tickets that, that you got. But that's also what he did for uh, Slave Play. Like, they were able to boast attendance because they gave away most of the seats for free. And the reason I was able to figure that out was because I went to the theater box office site. And the theater box office site tells you the amount of seats that were filled and it tells you the amount of money that was made. And if you divide the amount of money that was made by the amount of people who attended, you get to find out the average price per attendee and the average price per attendee ended up being so low. It becomes obvious that they comped like a huge bunch of the tickets to make it look full, which is why it will be like, and even then it wasn't hundred percent full, but it will be like three quarters full, but only like, based on the numbers, uh, full, full, full price sales for like a quarter of the theater. Right. So, you know, at two, around two 30 fans began to arrive, but fans of what fans of the movie, no fans of him, but 
he's only been out for two years. Like, how many fans does he really have? It's um, it's it's influential stuff. And then you know he he adds he adds this. He goes, uh, he wore he wore um. It talks about the outfit that he wore. Uh, it talks about who he came with. It talks about uh how, how what he wore was a response to Monique and something she did on social media. He wore a bonnet, you know, which is uh another plugging into the social media zeitgeist because Monique was trending for saying stuff about black women wearing bonnets and everything. But this is what he says. Mr. Harris thinks it is imperative to see Zola in a movie theater with a community like you would a play. This wasn't the first time he invited his fans on social media to join him for a viewing. He did so in Baldwin Hills, California, and Los Angeles. He also rented out the movie theater in Danville, Virginia, his hometown, so anyone who wanted to see the movie could. And they're making it seem like this is like some real humanitarian uh, charity, you know? Um, And he was even talking to like total strangers and he was talking to people in the corner and saying, um, so he's a man wearing a hat and holding a bag and he waves at him and he goes, Hey, have you seen Zola? What's your name? Do you want to see it? You know? And you know, it shows the people who attended and they're making it seem like in the post pandemic, he's bringing people together and recreating community and doing all this stuff. And this thing goes on and on. And it's like, why is this a story? Like some guy with a flopping movie started, you know, using his uh, precarious, newly gotten influencer status to desperately flail to get people in it, and it just goes on and on. Tons of pictures. Um, and the first thing I thought is, this person is either already friends with him and was contacted by him, right, or. This person sees that he's the hot guy now, and she's like, if I cover him favorably, if I cover him favorably, you know, I'll become part of his inner circle. Like, these people treat black celebrities, not like the James Baldwin, Nina Simone days. These days, it's Gossip Girl. That's why it's so fitting that he's working on Gossip Girl. These days, it's Gossip Girl because it's all mean girls. You can't sit with us. I want to be at the cool kids table um, type of queen bee stuff so it's, the, the story the story is pretty um horrible and fluffy and i just thought like this is just a really weird story so then i looked up the author's name and most of what they give it a right is culture stuff again right and um and there's a lot of product placement in the article too there's a lot of names of different people, names of brands, names of uh, brands that he has a relationship to. So this product placement. So anyway, I checked to see if she had any relationship with him. She didn't seem to have any ongoing key keying relationship with him, but she did this. Before the article published, uh, she posted a picture and it has a reference to the old Zola thread. And she goes, y'all want to hear a story about how me and this bitch linked up? And Basically, she's tweeting as in, hey, I got to meet, you know, Jeremy Harris, this celebrity, aren't it cool? So it kind of shows that she is like being a fan. She's she's taking this as you know, an excuse to be a fan. And when I was looking at that, I was like. People don't even try to hide it anymore. Like, uh, people will just, reporters will just straight up act like groupies to their, their subjects now. And it's just wet, wet your beak, get the bag culture. It's just very uh, normalized. But this is what I found interesting too. When I looked at the actual um, tweet and I looked at all the people responding to it, right? I was looking at it. And everybody was like cheering her for getting to meet him and everything. And, you know, name a more iconic duo. So it's full of like other blue checks cheering, cheering on, you know, saying how great it is. Somebody joked, no thanks. <laughs> but uh, I saw this guy here. 
and says, uh, Kurt Solar. I was like, oh, who's this Kurt Solar guy? He's a white guy. He goes, faves on faves. So he's like, you know, squealing and fangirling out. And then I looked at his profile, and it says, features director, New York Times, Times Magazine. So then I started thinking, is this guy like the editor? So like, even like the editor, I think he's the editor. Like even the editor is uh, encouraging like this fluffy um, tiger beat, you know, type of fawning uh, journalism. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, giving everybody a chance to wet their beak. So I just find it funny that it's just everything is just like the shadow economy of fakeness. Like everybody just pretending to um, that this thing is a success when it's not. And nobody wants to report it. Nobody wants to report that the thing is a flop. That's the part that's like crazy to me. They will sit, up, they will sit there and pretend or just casually leave out that the thing is a flop. Um, anyway, uh, last thing I want to talk about, I want to move on to the Lena Dunham thing. You know, but um, he had recently got in trouble for um, this. I thought this was another uh, good, good one. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. That's the other thing. The other person cheering. You're right. That was a Julia Craven chick who said that uh, she's fine hating black men. She could be pro black and hate black men. Yeah. That that was her. She was driven off Twitter, but she came back. Um, so he came out cheering uh, Lena Dunham. He says, y'all sit on Rihanna's internet, and I just hate the way that it talks. It sounds like uh, over-the-top faking black vernacular. Y'all sit on Rihanna's internet and talk about my good sis Lena Dunham like she didn't set the trend for a full decade of television and body every imitator that came after her by writing three of the top 20 best TV episodes this decade. She's human and made mistakes, but the pen is undeniable. So everybody went after him for that because Lena Dunham has done a lot of scummy things. She basically made a black man sound like a rapist for not uh, hitting on her or whatever, or whatever. She put this weird entitlement to like a black man's attention and then uh, label him like a sexist somehow for or fat phobic or whatever for not giving her a certain amount of attention, right? I think it was Odell Beckham, but she also helped smear a black woman as being a, a liar about rape. This this woman, Aurora Perrineau, who's the daughter of actress Harold Perrineau, and is an actress in her own right, was an intern or something on Girls, and one of the writers on Girls and a friend of Lena Dunham's was accused of uh, drugging and raping her. And when Perrineau came out about it, Lena Dunham called her a liar. And not long before, Lena Dunham had been tweeting about believe women, you have to believe women. But then when this came out, she goes, yeah, I know I said believe women, but unfortunately I have insider information that lets me know that this is one of the few 1% of um, rape accusations that's a lie, you know? And it turned out she didn't have any information. She revealed later that she was making it up and she had no inside information. And she apologized like like later down the road. And I guess the, the inside information she had was that the girl was black and her friend was white. But this is what Jeremy Harris says next. He goes, it's also obvious how few of y'all have met or interacted with her being Lena Dunham because her generosity knows no bounds. And I'm constantly grateful to have met her when I did. I've said it a thousand times, but she inspired me to start writing aggressively and not passively in secret. Now, think about how crazy what he just said is. He's saying that all of y'all who hate her for smearing a black woman as a liar about rape to prevent to protect a white male friend of hers or whatever, y'all just don't know her personally. Because if you did, you'd know her generosity knows no bounds. So what you're basically saying is that you're supporting her because she was personally generous to you. What does that have to do with why people hate her? Why should that negate the reason people hate her? Like, like how narcissistic do you have to be to think that people should suspend their principles 
because they're so happy you got put on by her. But this guy's crowd is like that. This is why I say about these people are in love with the idea and the narrative of their own getting on platforms. So he's counting on you being happy. Like, look, she was a good ally. She and by being a good ally, I mean she shit to regular black people, but she put a black blue check like me on. She might put you on one day if you personally get to meet her. Like that's his value system. If you've done good for me, even at the expense of the black community, that makes you good. And other black people should be cheering because should be cheering her on and the harm that she's done to other black people they should ignore because she put me on. And because she put me on, she might put you on one day. You know? That's the part that I thought was very... That's the part that I thought was very uh, insulting. I thought that was worse than the first tweet. And everybody was focused on the first tweet. And very few people, I think, pay attention to that second one. That second one, uh, apparently, y'all don't know her personally. Like, yeah, shit, we don't know her personally. What does that have to do with anything? But also, even if you did know her personally, if she's calling black women uh, liars about rape to defend white men, I don't have to know her personally. Like, like, how fucking narcissistic and transactional do you have to be to openly admit without even realizing it's shameful that it's only because you're personally um, friends with her and she hooked you up. And also the idea that we're supposed to forgive what she's done to powerless black people because of um, the fact that she helped you get the bag. You know? Um, yeah, it's like, like bullshit. You know, yeah, and obviously unprovoked. That's a crazy thing. No one asked her. But then here's here's the best part. And this part I didn't even know, and it made it worse. It turned out she he's friends with the girl that Lena Dunham accused. Well, friends in scare quotes. He's friends with the girl that Lena Dunham accused of being a liar. Uh and it turns out he's one of those people, he's like the black Tom Ripley. Like, you know, you know, you know, uh the talented Mr. Ripley. He really feels like the black uh tom ripley like because i'm like how do you even always be around these famous people all the time you know like all about eve if you ever seen all about eve like people just happen to always find a way to be around famous people and kind of uh leech off them and get more famous you know like uh those kato kalen types you know it's always like how are you always around famous people and in their business and you know getting the benefits and stuff um yeah, so even back then, this was years ago, before Slave Play, before Yale, all this stuff, he was there. So apparently he was there the night that this girl was accused of rape. And he's supposed to be her friend. The girl's father, actor Harold Perrineau, came in and jumped in. And he goes, shut your effing mouth. After introducing two teenage girls to 35-year-old Murray Miller and lying right to my face that night. So apparently... Jeremy O'Harris was there. He uh, lied to the father about where they were going and who they were going with. He introduced the two teenage girls to 35-year-old Murray Miller. And he adds, nobody wants to hear from you. The safety of black women has never been important to you. You know? And um, so, like, that was, like, really messed up. He basically almost calling the guy a procurer basically, you know, for, um, for Lena Dunham and this, and this white guy. But the fact that this guy was actually friends with supposed friends with, uh, the girl in question and he, and she, he's still doing this and kissing Lena Dunham's ass. That made it even, even worse. So he's even throwing away so-called personal friends, uh, for the fact that someone helped him get the bag. You know, that that I thought was even was even worse. And then he just kept doubling down and, and digging it deeper. And then he said this, which I thought was even worse. He goes, this is fully crazy. I think he tweeted this before the father jumped in. He goes, this is fully crazy. But just want to let some of you know that if you actually care about a survivor of sexual assault, who's also one of my oldest friends, uh, you know, a lot of people didn't realize at the time that she was his friend. Please stop posting her full name potentially re-triggering her and clogging her search with more reminders of that event. So basically, he tried to shame people into not mentioning the rape 
by acting like he was doing it for the benefit of the girl. But I would think signal boosting Lena Dunham and saying she's a great person and minimizing her mistakes, saying she made mistakes, but no one's perfect. Don't you think that's going to re-trigger your, your supposed friend even more? Seeing you be an apologist for uh, the person who tried to cover up for her rapist and called her a liar? You know? Uh, oh, no. Um, he's talking about He's talking about Harris. I thought he was talking about Dunham at first because I didn't realize that he was friends and there that night. But no, he's actually talking about Harris. He's saying Harris was the one that did all that stuff and is a liar. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, because you might still be triggered by what was said during the aftermath, but you know that you don't know all the levels of atonement and healing that are still ongoing in that situation. And perhaps respect the survivor by keeping her name out of your umbrage. So now he's using the rim survivor, um, the one, you, you know, um, the one that the father later uh, accused of steering, the one, the one that he, the father later accused him of steering to the uh, 35-year-old man and everything. And he goes, you might still be triggered by what was said, blah, blah, blah. And then later on, that's when that guy called him out and said, you basically fed my daughter to the rapist. You're a liar. Uh, keep, my, keep her name out of your mouth. And then he... He tweeted this two days later. He was quiet for a while. And he said, the parent no family knows that, and I'm happy that the work of healing I spoke about the other days is, is happening. Even if the healing is constantly complicated by the immensity of the internet. Then he, then he tweets at the girl that was his friend that, you know, um, accused the guy of rape. I love you. And I'm so excited by the artist you are and hope you all keep celebrating her exhilarating and deeply felt work and then he adds this he goes just had this let's see this is where it starts he goes just had a, a really amazing conversation with harold perrineau the father that called him out and his wife Brittany perrineau about the exchange the other day um it was a private conversation but you still felt the need to broadcast it and one that was needed to clarify the twitter insanity tuesday and uplift his tweet from last year to say justice for aurora so, okay, now you want justice for Aurora. You have to let everybody know that you talk to them and everything is cool now. Like, you know, um, I've known Aurora Perrineau for over a decade. And she's one of the most captivating young artists I met in my youth in L.A. So discovering what happened that night, I've been working with multiple detectives, lawyers, and, and PIs, private investigators, to tell the story of what Murray Miller did that night. So he's talking about both sides of his mouth. We don't know what was actually said in the conversation, but he made sure to um, tell everyone that he had the conversation and et cetera. So in general, the guy, you know, I feel like is kind of showing a lot of uh, scummy ways. But what was really interesting to me was how many people who were mad primarily focused the madness on the fact that he was defending a white woman. A lot of these blue checks have this weird competitive um love hate jealousy relationship with like with white women and so a lot of people were like that's what you get for defending white women on the timeline this and that and i'm like so you're mad at him for signal boosting you know this white woman who represents to you all your karen and becky fantasies and insecurities but this guy did a whole play about slavery rape being fun and black women begging white men to call them slurs and reenact slave rape on them. And then thanking the white men afterwards, after graphic traumatizing um, real-time rape scenes. And that didn't bother you. You care about black women so much. But him doing all that to the legacy of slavery, um, making like black women into these uh, people who like being degraded and who thank white men for degrading them, that wasn't your clue that he didn't respect black women, you know? Uh, oh, thanks for the donation. Jeremy Epstein. Yeah, it's like terrible friend. Terrible, terrible friend. Yeah, he, he fed her to a rapist and lied to her father about where they were going. Yeah, it, it's it's... 
he said about uh LGBT black men who sometimes deep down hate black women. I can believe it because that that slave play thing was really disrespectful to um black women. But you know why a lot of these blue checks gave it a pass? If you ever saw the play, it supports that black black men and white women are the weakest links. So the black man is a total racially unconscious buffoon who likes being used as a human dildo by white men and white women and the white woman is a total clueless karen the white men are trying to grapple with the racism and be better and be good allies but they just can't figure it out so the white men's racism is like well-meaning but clueless and they're grappling and grasping and they just can't shake the racist legacy but the white woman is gloriously ignorant and she's just there to be comedic fodder she's just stupid she's the biggest problem she's more racist than the white men and when you watch the audience that night they were really getting off on the humiliation of the white woman she was all the comic so yeah i think they like slave play because it was clowning white women and karens and everything and you know they like that they don't really care about black women really except for their own tribe and also they themselves identify with um, that character. So they think it's so deep down, they would do the same thing that character did. They like doing race play. They like being racially degraded. They like chasing white men. Like they're so grateful that it showed a black woman being desired by and having sex with a white man that they didn't care about the circumstances or implications and all that stuff. They make slavery jokes themselves and, and, race play jokes and all that stuff you know but so it bashed white women and it showed black women having sex with white men even if it's degraded gutter sex so that was good but now he's bigging up a, a white woman who they see as a competition they want to replace her they want to replace like the white woman in media the same way they want to replace the white woman in the white man in the white man's bedroom so, yeah, a lot of these blue check people aren't aren't crap. Uh, like there were a lot of people who hated slave play and hated everything he was about, who also jumped on him for this. But I saw a lot of people who had otherwise loved him, and this was their final straw. And to me, that is very telling that this will be your final straw, but not like that freaking other stuff. Yeah, ex exactly. This is exactly what they want. They, they want to uh, go back to slavery and be slaved by a benevolent slave master who looks like George Clooney. Um, but they would even take, uh, being on the bad plantation and being raped by Michael Fassbender. Like, um, they're, they're that sick. They are, they are that sick. And I'll give, I'll give another example, like, um, to show it doesn't even need to be a good plantation. And I'll show, I'll show you what I mean. Um, hold on a second. What's what's her name? Aisha Tyler. I think her name is Aisha Tyler. Uh, but she did a she did a joke once that I thought was crazy. Um, did you ever see Aisha Tyler make that uh, twelve years a slave joke? Um, let me see if I can find it. But it is. It is crazy. Um, I gotta find this thing. But she she made this she made this joke at, in a in a award show that I thought was um, really interesting, where she was hosting the show, and let me see if I can find the the video. It was the Critics Choice Awards, and hopefully the video is not taken down. It looks like it's taken down, but she made it. She made a joke. Yeah, it's taken down at the place. But she made a joke about twelve years a slave, and she says that twelve years a slave was so pretty that she almost wanted to go back to that time. Before adding, um, actually no, L let me find what you said. But basically, she said that um. The scenes with Michael Fassbender raping, um, raping 
what's her name? Lupita Nyong'o were um, hot, you know? And now she has a white guy who makes her breakfast and drives her around, you know? So she's kind of like living the dream. This is the same white guy who ended up um, divorcing her and taking a whole bunch of alimony money that he went and spent on another um, woman. But at the time, she was uh, sitting pretty and and happy about it. Yeah, unfortunately, the clip is taken down. If I try to read the joke, it's not going to be as heinous. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, damn it. It's taken down everywhere. I guess they kind of realize it's a bad look eventually. Somebody... Yeah, everywhere I used to find this clip, it is now gone. But they show they show a clip of they show a clip of um, Oprah in the audience. I think Oprah like you know hired her or whatever. Yeah, so Oprah was making faces and everything. But yeah, she said she said that uh, Twelve Years a Slave was so pretty and Michael Fassbender was so hot that she almost wanted to go back. To slave times, but she's like, oh, actually, no, I don't need to go back to slave times to get that because I had a white guy make me eggs and drive me here this morning. So you know, I'm really living the dream. I don't need to go back in time and get sex with uh, slave master Epps. It was very, yeah. Mindy Killing does this a lot in her in her stuff in her her stuff too. Yeah, but the reason I bring that up is like that's why the slave play thing didn't offend him and how it treated black women because um, if you read between the lines enough, they give away that they actually think that's hot themselves. You know, uh, what comedian? It was Aisha Tyler, the one who um, you've seen her, pretty girl. She is on the talk now, I think, on CBS. But um, anyway, that's it. That's all I had to say. Uh, Thanks for joining us today. And, you know, it's not too late before we go to donate either by hitting the super chat if you're enjoying the stream, um, hitting us on PayPal at champagne sharks at gmail.com, hitting us on Venmo or Cash App, you know, at champagne sharks, or becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash champagne sharks. So if you enjoy the information, if we help shed some light on things, then by all means, uh, definitely, definitely hit us up. And of course, like, comment, share, subscribe. That's always the best thing you can do, whether you donate or not. Uh, always like, comment, share, and subscribe. Thanks, everybody, for um, join, joining us. And yeah, man, we'll talk soon. Love all y'all. Yeah, she's on Archer. That's exactly what she is. If y'all if y'all search Critics Choice, Aisha Tyler, 12 Years a Slave, you might have better luck than me in finding it again because the old links I used to use for it are no longer uh, there. Okay? Be good, guys. Uh, thanks, Thomas Prieto. Appreciate it. Later.